the, uh, the privilege of introducing our guest speaker. Um, I understand some of you are here from class, so obviously feel free to, uh, to ask some very good questions about the topic of today, which is degrees of dignity, reforming era, higher education in the, for the global era. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Buckner, who is an assistant professor of higher education at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. She studies how global trends affect higher education policies, practices, and students, including what role the university plays in creating graduates' identities as future citizens, workers, and leaders. Her current research agenda focuses on two global trends, privatization and internationalization. Dr. Buckner has also, also has a longstanding interest and deep commitment to education in the Arab Middle East and North Africa. She received her BA from Swarthmore College and her MA and PhD from Stanford University. And we'd also like to note that this event is made possible in part thanks to a Title VI grant from the U.S. Department of Education for CCAS as a National Resource Center on the Middle East and North Africa. Um, so we'll listen to the talk and then we'll have hopefully plenty of time for questions and discussion as well. Thank you. Hi everyone. How are you? Yeah, thank you so much for introducing me and thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here today to discuss my work with you. So this, what I'm speaking today about is a work in progress, really. It's a book project that I'm working on. And it really comes out of a much larger study in many ways of over a decade studying higher education reform in various parts of the Arab Middle East and North Africa. And so I thought it might actually be of interest to, to you how I got how I became interested in this topic. So I was originally not interested in higher ed, you know, in, or education generally. But so I was I had just graduated undergrad and I moved to Morocco. I was a Fulbright grantee there and I was studying the role of English, the sort of growing influence of the English language and how it was competing with French and so, as sort of a language of power. When I got asked to teach a class at uh, Mohammed Sank University in Prabhat. And I literally had no advanced degree, no specialization, um, no contract, no office. I wasn't paid, but I literally was um, in charge of teaching two university level classes to about 40 Moroccans in the national university, essentially the first and oldest university in the country. And it was a really transformative experience for me. It changed my interest from sociolinguistics broadly to higher education because the students I were teaching were bright and brilliant and in many cases they also you know were struggling to get by they didn't necessarily have money to buy dictionaries or uh, the pay the fee to get to, to the university and so I really became interested in this question of how are universities and the states and the governments that are funding and organizing and managing these universities pro providing opportunities or failing to do so for their Youth. And that's the question that I really pursued ever since then. And I, that's what took me to do my uh, PhD in comparative education at Stanford. And since then, I sort of have traveled eastward in many ways. I started, do, I spent a, a long time in Morocco, but I've also done field work in Tunisia, Jordan, and Syria before the conflict. And then more recently, I spent more time in the Gulf. I was affiliated with the, the Cosme Foundation in Khaima, and so I've been in the UAE and Qatar as well, and Lebanon. So really, this book focuses on the countries where I've spent time living and studying. And it really emerges out of many, many conversations, like um, my dissertation field work, but also teaching, lecturing, and Honestly, just uh, you know, studying Arabic with my tutors or riding in a cab throughout the region asking people like, so where did you go to university? How did you make your choice? Why did you choose that place? And so in some ways, it's a bricolage effort of trying to really understand higher education policy and its reform throughout the region. So the, and it, I have a book manuscript that's currently, you know, under review, those of you I know who are work on, working on books, it's a very long-term effort, so it's not out yet, but I'm excited to speak on sort of where the book is going and what I argue in it. And I call it um, Degrees of Dignity, Reconsidering Higher Ed Reform in the Arab World. And so I'll just start 
with this, what I see, where, where did this book come from, really? Since the late 2010, when the people-led protests broke out in Tunisia and Egypt, much of the Arab world has really been upended. And so we know, and obviously these are ongoing today, but we know that in the academic circles and the popular media, the Arab Spring's call for bread, freedom, and dignity has in many ways been understood as a demand for economic and political justice, motivated by inequality, poverty, unemployment, repression, and corruption. And as I said, these protests are going ongoing throughout the region in Algeria, Sudan, Lebanon, and Iraq. And Young people and their discontents really have been central to understandings of the outbreak of the Arab Spring and ongoing protests. But these conversations about the causes and the consequences have rarely touched on the role of education and higher education in particular in shaping young people's lives and future opportunities. And I think that's in some ways due to like the blinders of the field. Scholars of Middle East politics tend to really focus on who has power or what they do you know, with that power, how they maintain that power, without spending much time on social issues such as education. Meanwhile, if you um, come from comparative ed, like I do, if you work in international development as I do, you, international development agencies have a lot to say about education. And these include the World Bank and USAID and others. But they tend to draw almost exclusively on economic theories of labor productivity. And they really criticize higher education in the region as inefficient and ineffective. And often, I mean, even worse, sometimes these policy discussions really adopt this Orientalist gaze that casts the whole region's systems as failing or lacking because they lack financial resources. And they're often characterized as like lacking in knowledge and whatnot. Um, and so I start the book from this premise that there, that we need better and deeper and more nuanced conversations about higher education policy and its reform in the region. And obviously, all of that is not. Just, there are some excellent scholars like Kida here who study education, but in in general, the we lack these nuances. She's really unique in that way to have these nuanced conversations about education, and so. I, having studied this topic for a decade, think of higher education as this really dynamic arena, and I really think of questions around higher education policy as invoking normative questions about who, you know, who this a society really is, who should profit from education, who deserves the benefits of a credential, for example, as well as many contentious policy debates over quality and access. And so I start from this premise that as long as the like, political scientists are ignoring education and the economists are sort of treating it as a purely technical matter, then important questions regarding higher ed reform are, are remaining unanswered and unaddressed. And so I start in my book saying that there's this pressing need for more nuanced conversations where we view higher education as simultaneously like a social and cultural and politically consequential institution, while also fully rejecting stereotypes of Arab societies as inherently lacking in knowledge or capacity or quality or local scholarship, which is entirely not true. And so I also start from this premise that uh, studying higher education as an institution is that higher education, the university, is a really important site that we can learn from that has a lot to teach us about um, Arab societies and uh, broad, more broadly. And so I argue that it, the, many of the problems that the, the Arab state is facing today are not simply you know, political questions of non-representative political systems or heavy-handed militias or high rates of corruption. I mean, these are all very true in some cases, but there are also manifestations of low levels of state legitimacy. And so the inability to provide young people with economic opportunity, social mobility, and a sense of progress and dignity um, have undermined the state's legitimacy in its young people's eyes. But these issues can't be divorced from higher education. Because that is the role that universities have historically played in their societies, providing that site for national unity, mobility, and opportunity. And so, in fact, there's I have a I draw on this quote, um, which is from a sociologist from a very different era and a very different con 
um, context if you study comparative ed, you might know this name, Wallerstein, but he argues the government needs the university as it needs the church, the arts, and the political and economic structures to say over and over that it's worthy of support. And so in some ways, I started this book thinking about higher education as this very important institution that we really need to understand better. And so with that as the background, I really think of my book as the story of this story, from this to this. And so and many of you may recognize these two universities and these two very different models of universities. And so in, we think of, uh, you know, scholars of higher education really think of the university as one of the most easily recognizable and legitimated sources of knowledge and advanced training in a society. And in their world, as in many parts of the world, and especially sort of post-colonial states, the university played a crucial role in state and nation building. Um, sort of for over 200 years. And so universities in this sort of early, uh, I, I in my research think of these two different eras. One is um, nation building and one is the global era. And so in this um, era of nation building, the, in many parts of, sort of modern uh, Arab Middle East and other post-colonial countries, universities were these symbols of social mobility, national unity, and economic development. And they played an important role in a larger effort to consolidate power under a more centralized state, to strengthen the legitimacy of their ruling regime, and to educate civil servants for an independent uh, post-colonial nation state. And this was, but, um, so in, in this era, uh, the, at, not everyone went to university. Not very many people went to university, in fact, right? They, they served a small proportion of the population. It wasn't considered, uh, uh, it wasn't intended to be mass or universal, right? It was, um, and then if you went to university, you often guaranteed employment in the public sector as part of a sort of, you know, um, uh, nation building. Or, and so, now we're in this new era, this post, you know, this era of globalization. National university systems are being called on to fulfill a very new mandate, and that is to produce highly educated, in many cases, entrepreneurial workers for globally competitive and mobile economy. And so. I, I call this sort of higher education for the global era. We are, dom you know, we are sort of embedding higher education policy within discourses of globalization and the knowledge economy, and increasingly looking to market provision and funding, we have new forms of um, governance, new models, including, you know, the transnational providers or international branch campuses. And in many ways, um, we are expecting. Uh, higher education to be a mass institution, if not a universal institution. So we, in higher ed, think of mass access as actually over 40% of the population, and univer uh, universal as like over 60. Uh, or, uh, so we are expecting increasingly large cohorts of students to go to university. And so this shift from higher education for nation building to a higher education for global competitiveness is not just affecting the Arab world, it's really a, a trend everywhere, but it does require, it's not an easy undertaking is what I, I would argue. It's actually very difficult to take a system that was designed for pretty small sizes of cohorts and suddenly <coughs> expand access everywhere. And um, so by most accounts, the Arab world is sort of failing at this shift. And that is evident if you study sort of the discourse on this. A constant stream of reports decries prof the problems of higher ed in the region. And if, on many different levels, on emissions, on financing, on governance, on quality assurance, um, the production of scientific research, all of these become sources of criticism, severe criticism in many cases, by international development experts and um, sometimes national governments as well. And so if you, um, the critiques, these critiques are often really t rooted in human capital theory, which is, um, argues that formal education makes labor more productive, and so 
by making labor more productive, it now has more economic value. And so economists in the region have, for decades have argued that the educational institutions are of low quality, and they're not preparing youth for this, their new, um, with the knowledge and the skills that they need for productive employment in this new sort of global economy. And so what this looks like, yes. Um, this is just one example, <laughs> for example, it, the Global Knowledge Index, uh, it, I just use this to sort of point out that this exists, that we're now like, increasingly um, ranking countries based on their sort of global knowledge, and this um, index argues that Arab countries need to improve their education systems. That's just, you know, take it for granted. I would, this is an example of the discourse. And so they're saying, oh, everywhere is sort of failing at this except for the UAE which is more dynamic. But this is really just, I don't, I, I'm, I'm putting this up there to take it with a grain of salt. This is one clear example of how this discourse is pervasive and, and really ubiquitous. And so the, what you notice in this literature that we're, we're ranking countries and ranking institutions is that people are very rarely mentioned. I mean, we don't really think about individual people's lives except to the extent where they're sort of undermining effective implementation of policy reform. Um, and the higher education system is reduced to its numbers. I mean, like, what does 33.2 even mean, right, on a global index? And so we, but it, this is just, it's reduced in every domain, right? The budget is, um, the admissions rate, quality assurance becomes a particular indicator. Research productivity is measured by how many publications in peer-reviewed journals, typically in English, you know, per 10,000 individuals. Like these are very um, quantified indicators of quality and whatnot. And so the reality of people's lives, their everyday lived experiences as they're navigating these changing policies and the higher ed systems are very rarely taken into consideration. And the various reasons that we know young people attend university, including social status, their parental pressure, pure boredom, or marriage prospects, there's a lot of you know social and cultural studies that point to the diverse reasons why young people attend higher ed, they are very rarely considered and sort of the dominant lens is one of economic productivity, right? And moreover, these reform approaches tend to look for a very quick fix technical solution, whether it is in the form of privatization or let's just create public-private partnerships, let's have a new quality assurance agency or mechanism, or international. let's import um, an international best practice and um, they largely ignore the broader social and political context in which these reforms are actually very debated and contested and then often you know, unaffected, not implemented fully, and there's always a concern of why the reform wasn't effective without sort of recognizing that the reform was sort of additive in the first place. And so the point that I just make in my book, I take a very different approach to doing this work, and um, it, I really want, I hope that I frame it as trying to overcome some of the limitations of this technical universalizing prescription by adopting a sociological and comparative perspective on higher ed reform in the Arab Middle East, which comes from my own training in comparative ed. And so I look at both sort of what is going on in terms of like why are different countries adopting different policies? What are the big policies that um, have changed higher ed in the region? And then what are their effects on young people's lives or professors or the different actors negotiating in these spaces? And so this is the way I think of my book um, in many ways. I, by saying I adopt a sociological approach, what I mean is that I think of higher education as a social, cultural, political institution. So when we think about reform, we're not just asking like a purely technical question of what works and how can we implement what works, right? We're thinking rather, um, we're recognizing that different stakeholders have interests and thinking through like how individuals are negotiating structures or norms that are institutionalized norms and different individuals' interests. And then, um, I, so by saying it's a social institution, I draw on Andre Mazawi, um, who I know some of you read for today, when in, in the class, what he calls um, 
higher education a precarious and contested terrain in Arab societies that's linked to social status, political influence, and economic opportunity. And I really use that to think about some of these issues that, for example, the World Bank would position as a purely technical issue, like what should be the standard of admissions to university. You know, on the Tajiki, for example, should it be 55 or should it be 60, right? That's a, in one sense, it's a purely technical question of what should be the minimum standard. But on another question, it's very political. It's who gets access to the um, power and status that a university degree comes with, or who should get access to the most elite and prestigious degrees, like an engineering or a medical degree, right? And so that's how where I start. And I say, well, if, you know, then if you understand how important this degree is, then the difference between a 59 and a 60 is actually very consequential. And it's not surprising that students and families are adopting many, many strategies from private tutoring to just cheating to get that higher you know, great, right? And so that's sort of one of the issues that I study. And then, um, secondly, when I say I adopt this multi-level approach, I draw on a very long-standing tradition in comparative ed, where we think we situate um, education systems within global, national, and local contexts, and we recognize that they're simultaneously being influenced by many different factors. And so, within comparative ed, we point to sort of two um, big shifts discursive shifts in higher education that I you know, think of as these global discourses. And one of these um, is the, the idea that education at all levels, including higher education, is now both possible and desirable for ever larger proportions of youth. And in many cases, at the lower levels, it's framed as a human right. So we think, and increasingly, higher education is included in those discussions as a right. In 2015, the UN and um, all of you know, its nations passed the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, and in that, goal four is the goal on education, which um, includes, it actually includes a year of post-secondary in it. So it actually commits all nations to provide not only a full course of primary, like basic and secondary, primary, secondary, but also one year of higher education as well. And so increasingly, uh, countries are committing to expanded access to higher ed. But we, also, we see it both as a right and a catalyst for development. And so at the same time, the end of the Cold War has meant this rise in neoliberal thinking. Honestly, it's sort of a neoliberal global era where higher education is being shaped by particular and powerful discourses about how to fund and manage higher education. So I really focus in my book on two of what I think of as the knowledge economy discourse, which positions knowledge as central to national economic development, and neoliberalism, an ideology that contends social policies of all sorts, including education, should be guided by market principles, including deregulation and consumer choice. And so that has led to you know, not only the rise of privatization, but also in many cases, it's like filtered down to the individual level where young people are now expected to sort of be the entrepreneurs of their own lives, right? Where they sort of manage and um, navigate their own sort of destiny in um, deregulated markets. And so these two discourses have been developed and diffused by really powerful global actors, including the World Bank, the United Nations, and many donors, such as the US and the European Union, in the form of very specific policy models. And so that's how we sort of think of this. Um, and these would include, for example, like private higher ed or quality assurance. And so part of what I do is um, I actually focus on these models, these, I focus on topics rather than countries, which is one of the things that I um, am happy to talk about. So I then think about how are these models filtering down to countries that have very different histories, very different demographics, different populations, different geographies, and um, political systems. They're filtering down in different ways and they're taking effect in very different ways, for example, in North Africa versus the Gulf. And then young people and professors and others in those spaces are navigating them in very different ways. So instead of focusing on countries, which I would say is the norm, and makes a lot of sense if you're really interested in deep contextual historical understanding, um, I actually focus on topics. And I 
do that because I'm interested in the contemporary era where the sort of modern era of Middle East and North Africa has been grouped together in development in particular as sort of a singular region and models are sort of, you know, sort of thought that they will work throughout their region, they're treated. Um, so the first one is access and admissions, where I do look at this increased demand for access and think about how the admissions to university reflects and perpetuates long-standing state society contracts and how those are sort of under pressure in the new era for a demanded, uh, for increased access. And then the one that I'm gonna talk about more in depth today is quality and its assurance. So quality is this, as I mentioned, you know, a crisis in, is perceived to be a crisis at least. And I focus on, I will later sort of deconstruct this discourse of what this means and then how um, governments are trying to then assure quality by t adopting new reforms. And then I, if you guys have questions, I'm always happy to talk about these other three topics as well that I write about. One is on private higher ed and how, um, where is private higher ed, uh, private providers, private universities sort of taking off and flourishing versus where is it very contested? And I look at that and I sort of argue that it's flourishing among those who aren't being well served in the public system and, um, and sort of what that means for the public university. And then I also look at internationalization, which is a broad term we use in higher ed to think about many different trends around the way that a national university or system is embracing the global in its mandate. And so we're trying to not only incorporate international content, but also branch campuses, um, or one example, or recruiting international students is another, and how in many ways this is being used to sort of confer legitimacy and status and distinction to those who, who are either attending or benefiting from these new opportunities, but at the same time, the, the sort of tensions that creates with the national character of higher ed and the way that it is often used to sort of like reify um, sort of Western or foreign models at the expense of the local. And then the last thing I talk about is research and this intense focus on productivity, which is often measured by um, journal articles, honestly, like patent production or journal articles, and the fact that these research outputs are not really taking into account structural realities, and I sort of make an argument that we need to do a better job of thinking of research as a social and creative act in many ways. But today, I'll just focus on quality and its assurance, and. Um, and then, but yeah, in q and A, I'd love to talk about any of the other topics. So I call this, in some ways we can think of this like the so-called quality crisis. And I, 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 I stand by this so-called quality crisis. So in some ways, the quality of higher education throughout the region is characterized by this all-consuming crisis rhetoric. That's what Gutierrez says in her ethnography of learning in Morocco. And it's so pervasive, I'm sure many of you know, the technical experts, the academics, the policy makers, you know, even leaders themselves largely agree that higher education, like primary, like secondary before it, suffers from low quality. And so if you want to understand this, what, I mean, what is the nature of this quality crisis, you do have to put it, I say, in global perspective. So there is this increasing global emphasis um, that goes back to the knowledge economy discourse uh, that quality is crucial to economic competitiveness in a global knowledge economy. That is the discourse, that we need um, highly educated, highly skilled workers for the labor market, right? And so this discourse really positions nation states at this sort of national level as in competition with one another. That's like the overarching message, is that we, like at the national level, competing with one another for scarce resources, including scarce human resources, meaning highly skilled individuals. And so supporting higher quality at the, by a government or at the, by an institution is in many ways signaling a desire to participate in this knowledge economy, a willingness to do whatever you know, it takes to participate, and then ensuring that you will be, continue to be economically competitive. And so if, there's, but there's no 
there is no definition of quality. If you study um, quality from an educational perspective, literally, there is no definition. I mean, UNESCO has tried, and they're, um, they have conventions on higher education for the 21st century, and they have quality assurance, you know, books, very large ones. And so, for example, um, in 1998 at the you know, higher education convention, UNESCO defines quality as a multi-dimensional concept that must encompass, quote, all functions and activities of higher education, including teaching and academic programs, research and scholarship, staffing, students, buildings, facilities, equipment, services to the community, and the academic environment. All of that. And I mean, obviously, that's very big, right? And very comprehensive at the same time. And I mean, I would say that we in education are very skeptical of this and would say that if you think about who gets to be high quality, it's it's institutions with lots of resources that are have that have been historically institutionalized over many decades as having those resources, right? And the um, and there's you know skepticism to the newcomers who want to have those that quality and those resources instantly and overnight, right? Like in the Gulf. But um, so in the absence of this clear definition of what quality means, we have, there are a number of different approaches. But one that I would say is dominant everywhere is this um, proxy of using ranking. Right? And so international rankings become this proxy for who is high quality and who is not. And um, so we see this, the Times uh, Higher Ed has put out their own rankings. There's a number of ranking systems if you study this. But, um, and then every institution that's in the top 500 gets to advertise it. You know, I was at AUB and they have a big banner um, saying that their, you know, their medical school is this ranked this on the QS rankings. And then, you know, in the, the, the Times Higher Ed is a UK based ranking and it specifically gives more weight to international students and international faculty where UK uh, institutions do very well. And so the UK institutions always look better on the Times Higher Ed than they do on some of the other, like the um, Shanghai list. But this, so these rankings are, you know, uh, uh, sort of affecting institutions all around the world. But they're also being used to really criticize the Arab world. I'm not sure if you guys have read any of the critiques of these, but they are always sort of used to, to like, indicate this general thinking that Arab universities are falling behind those in other parts of the world. And so back um, in 2009, an Economist article it, um, explains this as a listing of the world's top 500 universities compiled annually by Shanghai in includes three South African universities, six Israeli universities, but not a single Arab one. And then, of course, there's been some shuffling, but even in 2016, the Brookings, um, a blog post by Brookings, echoes the same sentiment, stating only two or three Arab universities are in the list of top um, 500, and none are in the top 200. And so, you know, they upped the bar. Now there are some in the five, the top 500, but that's not good enough. There are still none in the top 200. And so, um, this is just one example of how this course of competitiveness is being used. But I would say that if you, it's also really widespread in the region. Um, for the past three decades, honestly, this quality has been decried in the local media and international reports. And so I just, in my book, I mean, I go, I have a series of these. These are just some um, newspaper articles, but they are, if you actually sort of read the reports that have come out, like, that all the way back in 2002, the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, in their um, Arab Human Development Report, stated the Achilles heel of education in the Arab world um, is quality. It's the flaw that undermines any quantitative <coughs> achievements. And then by 2005, the um, sort of updated version of the Arab Human Development Report maintains this emphasis on poor quality. It says the lack of knowledge capital is the main long-term problem faced by the Arab world, and declining quality is the most important challenge faced by Arab education. And you hear this like over and over. In 2013, um, the Center for the Mediterranean Integration, which is a project by the World Bank, um, re reiterates the same idea. The divide between education and employment has not been bridged, and the quality of education continues to be disappointing. Um, this is just 
I mean, it's everywhere. It's, and I would just say, I, you know, we cannot deny that students are frustrated, I mean, that young people are frustrated and that there are really high unemployment rates. The point that I am going, that I will continue to argue in my book and in this talk is that they, we're, we blame higher education for that. And I think that is where the blame is often misplaced, rather than looking at the labor market and the structural constraints in the labor market. And so I'm not denying that high unemployment rates are a source of frustration. I just think that it's not, the airport is not alone in these uh, frustrations, and that it is, that there's only so much higher education as an institution can do, and that in many cases it's a, we're, looking, we're thinking about problems in the labor market. And so, um, that's sort of what I do in my book, is I really deconstruct this discourse. Like, what is this discourse really saying? And I would say that this widespread consensus that higher education suffers from low quality is actually a series of arguments which we can deconstruct, and each one of them is flawed in its own way, or it's just overly simplistic, I would say. So the first one is really that there is low quality. Just we take that as a granted, like the quality is low. And what that means is really that the offerings are low, the outputs of the higher education system are poor, and this often um, it means like, oh, the class sizes are really, are really large, students can't find a seat in their lecture hall, there are few resources, right? A lot of times this is, um, there are, it's a very quantitative measure. It's like, okay, the, how many books does the library have, et cetera, are what we're using to sort of um, think about what it means to have like low quality. <coughs> Students aren't um, learning very much. Oh, that's also, there's a big emphasis on um, professors' pedagogies, right? Like, oh, it's all rote memorization. The students aren't learning how to be critical thinkers. That's a big uh, common theme in this as well. And then, we move from that to say, due in part or due primarily to this low quality output of the higher ed system, that then there is clearly a mismatch between the needs of the labor market and the skills that graduates have. And then, naturally, it is this mismatch that is to be blamed for sluggish economic growth and high rates of unemployment, particularly among youth in the region, right? And so, um, one, so one of these critiques, or especially if you focus on this mismatch, is that, okay, there are too many students who are concentrating in the humanities and social sciences. I'm not sure if you guys have heard that one, but it's very common. In 2008 report, the World Bank explains that one of its measures of quality is the proportion of all undergraduate, uh, of all university students majoring in the STEM fields, the science, technology, math, and engineering. And this, this is a direct quote. It, uh, its underlying assumption is that, quote, scientists and engineers are likely to contribute more to economic growth than our social scientists and students of the humanities uh, because of the increasing importance of technological innovation and adaptation in development. And so, to support this claim, they cite a study from 1991, 17 years uh, before the study itself was published, and well before the spread of like computers, the internet, etc. And actually, I mean, you may take this statement for granted. Uh, it might be common in the sort of, I mean, I hope not, as people who have masters of you know Arab studies, but um, the. But a lot of economists are, I mean, there's a lot, this is not proven fact, I would say. In fact, there's a lot of really interesting literature in the economics of education that's actually arguing you need um, people with uh, social science and humanities backgrounds to know how to adapt to technologies and change them, right? And so this is, first of all, not to be taken um, lightly, like as fact. And, and then the next point that I would just make is the claim that too many students in the Middle East and North Africa are majoring in the social sciences and too few in the sciences and the STEM fields is also not proven. I mean, I would, this is from the most recent data um, by UNESCO. And if you look at this, we see that um, <coughs> this is the, at the regional level, the Middle East and North Africa actually has one of the highest proportions of students graduating with STEM degrees of any world region. It's actually very close to the global average. It's higher than, um, or it's very equivalent to East Asia. Asia here refers to East Asia, where you know we put there. East Asia is seen as a 
region where, that's doing things right in terms of economic development, right? It's um, rapidly growing economies, and it's actually higher, um, we have more in STEM than in Europe and other places. And so, first of all, I just uh, don't take these discourses at face value because they're very rarely substantiated with actual empirical evidence. And then, the if you move on, then this unemployment and stagnant, stagnant economy is almost always the thing that's placed on higher education, right? It's this low quality and this mismatch that is portray, uh, leads to unemployment. And unemployment is the real crisis because, and this is often rooted in, you know, sort of concerns about the destabilizing effect of young people, particularly young men, right? And so the 2002 Arab Human Development Report refers to unemployment as the scourge of joblessness, which affects Arab countries more seriously than any other developing region. And it points to high um, youth unemployment rates as sort of like the natural, sort of as a crisis. It's called, you know, like a ticking time bomb and other sort of de-state has having de-stabilizing um, consequences and actually this is said this is almost always like blamed on higher ed so for example one report by the World Bank says there are no proper signals sent to higher education establishments in terms of which skills are in demand and which skills are not in demand and so as a result the graduates can't find jobs and then they actually call for like better data so that families can do a better job of um, informing students and parents which um, degrees are actually in demand, et cetera. But if you know anything about how admissions works, like, that is really ridiculous because many students don't choose their own degree, right? They um, only get to study what they have a sort of, you know, what the, based on their score, they're sort of slotted into a particular degree program. And so these, so my point around these are like the technical literature that I'm summarizing here paints a very linear, very simplistic equation between these mid, low quality, misaligned incentives and then clearly causing high rates of unemployment and stagnant economic growth. And so this is, I mean, largely because the lens is one of human capital um, theory that just assumes that the ultimate goal is employment and that if we have high unemployment, then it must be because we have a failing higher education system. It's sort of that backward causality that I really take issue with. And so moving on from this, like, so the crisis is very clear, right? The, the crisis rhetoric has been set up for, for decades. And so given this all-consuming crisis rhetoric, you have governments that are actively trying to address the higher education quality in, in many ways, right, to the extent that they can. And so some scholars have actually argued that this crisis rhetoric is useful in a political sense because it's trying to create constituents and um, motivate different interest groups to push for reform. And so they, like e Egypt and Morocco, have used sort of a crisis rhetoric to try to bring together like a consensus on reforming higher education. And then when these sort of consensus uh, committees often stall, development agencies, particularly the World Bank, has been very, uh, has played a very influential role in pushing reforms. So throughout the world, not just in the Arab world, the World Bank is the largest funder of higher education um, reform uh, throughout the world. They really, you know, have tackled it. And so this, so in my book I sort of just look at what is the World Bank doing in higher ed? And they're really funding large-scale reform, in many cases, that's sort of government-initiated, government-led, at least. Uh, um, and it's this has happened in Egypt, Jordan, Morocco, Tunisia. Um, and in, they're sort of adopting very generic uh, approaches that include, like, let's expand private higher ed, let's create quality assurance. Uh, um, and you know, in some cases, like in North Africa, this was done by mapping degree reform onto the Bologna reforms that um, were under, being undertaken in Europe as well. And so, the result of this, like this, this outsized role that these agencies are playing, um, 
means that they have very technical approaches. So, so these are reforms that are like, okay, let's have a, let's add in, let's create a new quality assurance agency, let, um, a new bureau, um, let's create an accreditation council uh, to have our degrees accredited, um, or let's sort of have new minimum standards, for example. And so essentially, my main point here is like since the 90s, the World Bank has really funded numerous higher education reform projects that are generating resources uh, to reform higher ed in the sort of middle income countries of their region. But what's going on in the era of Gulf is very different. So I, I also look at sort of what's going on in the GCC. And obviously, rather than relying on World Bank projects to secure external funding and be able to have like high profile major restructuring, the UAE and Qatar have taken a very different approach. But th what I point out in the book is it's not that different, right? They've also brought in um, external consultants to align their higher education systems to what we call the like, global best practice. Right? So in the UAE, they established the Commission for Academic Accreditation, which is seen as like a best practice in the region because it's a fully independent, a supposedly fully independent body that's supposed to license the um, public, both the public and the private universities and accredit their um, academic programs. And then almost more than nearly any other country, there's Qatar, which has put its faith in these external technical experts to reform its education system. So I'm sure that's many of you know about this, but in the, when Rand's uh, work in Qatar was not only at the K-12 level, but was also reforming Qatar University, right? So in 2001, the Supreme Education Council commissioned Rand Corporation, which is an international think tank based in Santa Monica, to advise and oversee its major reforms. And so if you look at what they suggested, they were, I mean, largely reflected the fact that they're located in the United States, right? That a lot of the reform models are very similar to the ones that sort of we have do dominate education policy in the US, such as like um, in introducing in, um, independent schools, which are sort of like charter schools in the US system, and publishing a school report card. Again, a very you know um, American idea of what it means to like assess quality. And then also switching the language of instruction and science to English, right? And so then when you look at the reform of the university, um, the, the, so the administration of the university had to make a decision. They wanted to sort of reform the university very quickly to become like what they call high quality, where I would say that in this, um, if, if you want to, simple definition of high quality, then rigorous is a good one. We, high quality often is being mapped onto like rigor, right? So let's have higher standards, essentially. And so when we think of quality um, in that way, in the book that the uh, brand wrote afterwards called The Reform of Qatar University, they explained that they were really faced with a choice. One was preserving the status quo in which a university education was available to all nationals as the sort of free public um, university, national university, or literally this is posed as a dichotomy, upholding academic standards. That is the way it's phrased, either all or upholding the standards. And so the administration decided that the Qatar University would uphold its new standards and aim to serve only average and above average students while expanding the preparatory foundation program um, to you know, sort of compensate for the uh, higher level of language skills and whatnot. And so the key recommendations they made were set standardized admissions requirements, let's set minimum standards for retention, let's have higher academic regulations, et cetera. And so what I noticed from these is like they really focus entirely on student preparation. It's all about like student preparation to get into the university. They're not addressing student supports for learning once they're in at all. And they're not really um, addressing sort of what's going on in the classroom either. And so the point that I would make is that upholding high academic standards sounds good. Like we believe in that. That's, you know, banners. We put that on our banners in high school. It's like 
high standards for all. But, and it sounds like perfectly legitimate policy, and it sounds like a good thing. And that's sort of the way in which these discourses are sometimes, uh, they become so pervasive and unquestioned is because they sound good, right? But in reality, what they did was they excluded a lot of students, and as the only place, the only place you could go to university as a country citizen, um, many families found that their students literally didn't have a place in the university system at all, like that they couldn't access it. And that was, um, that disrupted the ex sort of the existing norms and the expectations of families. And so I did interviews, um, they are asking, and one of my respondents was explaining, well, they revamped Qatar University between 2003 and 2006, and the plan was to, quote, transform the institution, but that what it resulted in is that um, families found that they didn't have a place in this new system. And so there was resistance, there was complaints, and the country's leadership realized that they disrupted society too much. It was too much for society to absorb, because in, at the end of the day, the main audience for reform is citizens. And so um, now, from the outside, compared to that, we really think of this. Um, so you know, in 2013, the Qatar Foundation formally ended its contract with RAND, and this policy institute closed. And we really, in some ways, see this as a model of like, what not to do. You can't really bring in external consultants to institute rapid change overnight, and in their wake, leave sort of national citizens feeling like they had no place in this new system. And I, when I think about quality generally in higher ed, I often think that we all want high quality, we all want prestige, but only to the extent that it doesn't exclude us. Nobody wants so high quality that they no longer get to go to, you know, X, Y institution, right? Or they don't get the access to the degree. And I think that, so it's a natural understanding. The resistance is natural. And so I really think of these large scale quality assurance reforms as state projects in many ways that are aimed at securing legitimacy from a skeptical public that has been told it's, you know, higher education system is in crisis and of low quality at home and then also abroad in this knowledge, you know, to recruit foreign capital and whatnot, foreign investment. And so the reality is it can be very delegitimizing to acknowledge that the public higher education system is failing because these systems, um, the universities have played such an important uh, nation building role for so long. And so in the middle income <coughs> countries, this can often be massaged and done through um, major government led reforms that are being supported by the World Bank. And they're, so they're both securing finances, they're also signaling state investment in quality and a desire to reform. And then, you know, if you look at the case <coughs> in North Africa, it makes a lot of sense that the governments wanted to rapidly align to the new European system um, that was adopted in the early 2000s, the Bologna reforms, because in many ways the uh, people, the citizens are interested in making sure that they can sort of study abroad in Europe, right? That's a natural progression for many upper middle income families in the region. And so in contrast, in the Arab Gulf states, quality assurance is not, of course, resource generating, but it has drawn up foreign consultants and think tanks to align these um, Gulf systems to best practices in the US and the UK. And so despite their differences, though, the approaches to quality really look to external and foreign international models as blueprints for success. And it results in this sort of implicit encoding of quality as foreign in ways that often sidestep national policy processes. It really disregards local perspectives on quality or the interests of affected stakeholders who are really gonna be affected by these reforms. And so despite um, all of these, this like sort of huge movement to stamp quality on higher ed and these reforms, they've actually had, and many people would argue, a pretty limited impact on the teaching and learning in classrooms. And so, for example, in 2016, I asked a prominent scholar um, on quality, and he was like, no, no, they believed or they claimed that these agencies would resolve the problem, but you may be sure they have not resolved the quality issue. 
And in my book, I really talk a lot about the structural issues. Like it, underlying this desire are very real structural issues in both the, um, throughout the region. So for example, when I was in the Gulf, in UAE, one of the practices that uh, uh, many private universities are doing is trying to get international accreditations for their like engineering programs and whatnot. And I was talking to a faculty member, and he was explaining that these are very time intensive processes, right? You have to submit all of your, your syllabi, and you have your CVs, and you have to show student work. And they're very time intensive. And, um, he was like, well, the faculty have very little reason to participate in these because it, they actually operate in a situation where they aren't even with uh, their labor contracts are very unstable in many of the private universities. And so he's like, he says, you know, why would we even worry about this? Students will be here longer than we are. At any point, the university administration can cancel your contract and you're going to have to leave the country. And he felt like that really undermined his investment in sort of in building up the institution. And then, for example, what happens in the sort of middle income countries, I would say in most of those I visited, it's really a pressure for access. That is a, the major structural, one of the major structural constraints. So for example, when I was in Jordan in 2013, I was speaking with the uh, vice president of the university, and he was saying, you know, this the government of Jordan created a unified um, quality assurance uh, uh, council that was actually uh, very innovative in a way because it was going to apply the exact same standards to both the public and the private institutions, which was new and seen as a good practice. And but in reality, they couldn't. So they couldn't uphold those standards in the public system because of these pressures for access. And so, even though you're supposed to have a certain number of like student-faculty ratio, that's often how it's measured. You know, like 30 students per one faculty. He said. Um, he was explaining like that you tell the government the unified admissions council like exactly how many students you think that you can take but they don't respect it he said usually you could double or triple that number the university requested 3,000 new students and we ended up taking 8,600 incoming freshmen 8,600 when we think our capacity is already stretched to the limit at 3,000 and that's really I mean that's why I think these technical solutions are really hard. It's the same government that's upholding, I mean, you know, the same state in general that's upholding the quality assurance uh, requirements and the need to meet students and uh, families' demand for access. And, and so broadly, my argument, and I'll just wrap up here, is that these technical reforms that are seeking to assure quality are really missing a number of fundamental points. And the first is that they're in many, in many cases technical that are ignoring the broader social and political purposes of higher education as a marker of status and as a, in many cases a positional good. You don't, not, you don't just want to go to university, you want to go to like a particular university program and it's not only for the employment outcomes, it's also you know many people that I've talked to like want to study one thing but their parents want them to study something else for status reasons and so um, and then I really from an educational perspective the point that I really like to emphasize is that when we assume quality when we think of quality that can be distilled into very measurable and quantifiable indicators we're overlooking the fact that teaching and learning is relational students are learning in relation to one another and their professors and also with their own sort of visions of their own futures and so we're really missing out on that that these you know the class size or the library volumes are not are not a good measure of the quality of relations and that we're also um, not focusing on sort of that what is teaching and learning and what is going on in the classroom, right? And I really argue, I believe strongly that the professors and the students in the region are as intelligent and creative and hardworking um, as anywhere in the world. And the professors are teaching the best and the brightest students in their nations. And um, we are, the, the real casualty of the crisis rhetoric is this form of like everyday excellence that's already going on, right? Where teachers are working overtime to sort of navigate really difficult circumstances to teach and in good ways. And I, so what I try and do, one of the things I try and do is really like reframe these conversations on higher education 
uh, that are happening in, you know, in think tanks and development agencies and donors that and say one of the most harmful and pervasive stereotypes is that the region's higher education systems are sort of lacking, or like fundamentally lacking. And there's this sense of inferiority that's perpetuated by a deficit orientation, which continues to view non-Western societies as, and this is not just in the Arab world, this is everywhere, I mean this is like sort of higher education everywhere. We view any non-Western society as like lacking in capacity, lacking in knowledge, largely because they have fewer resources. And we continue to reify European and North American universities as, as like the models for reform. And so I argue that we need to really rethink these conversations. We need to rec um, you know, start from the premise that there's a long history of indigenous scholarship and intellectual tradition that continues and that, that universities have always played really important roles, not just in labor market preparation, but in building societies and their critical sites for citizenship development and protest uh, that is ongoing today. So um, I will stop with that, but I, I will say like, how would conversations about higher education reform in the Arab world change if that's where we started? Thank you. <laughs> So we have some time for questions, uh, discussion. Um, I thought maybe I'd ask the first question about sort of the, a lot of the problems you identify here are very much related to kind of state reform, state-led reforms. Mm -hmm. So how does privatization kind of play into whether it's, it's actually addressing any of those questions or issues in a more efficient way or you know, kind of dealing with problems that may be more uh, beyond the purview of the state specifically because there's a lot of kind of underlying political objectives that the state is trying to accomplish that maybe privatization may or may not um, be thinking along the same terms. Should I take that question? Uh, sure, why don't we go around yeah. maybe take a few more questions then. Yeah, right. Yes. Sorry. Um, uh, have you done any research about like how, what Arab students look how they look at Western universities, because a lot of Arab students, like myself, have left uh, their countries and to seek education here, for example, because we found problems within our own systems, or because of has to do a lot with social mobility. Like, if you could talk more about mm -hmm. the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you. Uh, uh, this has been an overview and a sort of generalized uh, view of the region. Uh, I don't know if you're prepared to look at individual countries, but I, if you are, I was just wondering, uh, with regard to Palestine, how do you see that as exceptional, and how do you see that as um, within this whole movement of your analysis? We'll do one more for this round. Also, um, Thank you for your presentation. Since you've worked in the Gulf states, did you also look at uh, teachers and pedagogy mm -hmm. in terms of are, are they being prepared, prepared to work in these Western models or in, for, since internationalization is happening, how are local professors uh, dealing with that? Yeah, okay, great questions. Thank you all. Um, well, okay very different ones. I can. I guess I'll start with the individual. So I don't look at Palestine in, I just, um, and, but in my thinking, I, yeah, I don't, I mean, I, there's a bunch of countries I obviously don't look at. I don't really look at any of the countries that are currently like in conflict settings, honestly, and that's, I mean, there's so much more complicated even than what I am doing, but also I do think that to the extent that I, I think that one of the arguments I do think about is that in countries that have been more fragmented either because of conflict or other, or like the state has generally been weaker, they do tend to have more privatization. And that's not just in the Arab world, that sort of we see that in many places. And so that's the case in Lebanon, you know, where there's really only one public university. And then, um, and so in Palestine, there, you know, the universities are all considered private universities in some ways. Okay. Um, 
So, no, I just don't look at them. But um, I, so in terms of privatization, I think, I, I think it's a really interesting question. Like, I study private higher education as a phenomenon that's growing everywhere in many cases. And it is, I, but from like a non-ideological stance, like there are advantages to the private universities in many cases, and there are, but they also have, they're very contentious. Like I think that's the main point that I really try and think about is that the, the private higher ed is seen as an apolitical solution to all of the problems with the bureaucracy and the, you know, mismanagement or the way in which the public universities, like who's on the board is very political and these other sort of the, the political dynamics are seen as very messy. And so private higher ed is sort of used as a way of solving these problems is like more efficient and like outside. I mean, in fact, I would argue that the where private, who gets the contract to open a new private university and how they get to run it and what the, um, the policies are governing whether they can be for profit or not, all of that is actually very political and in, in, implicated in sort of the state processes. So, but um, I think of, if you look at who, but the what we know for sure is that private universities do tend to be um, tuition, they tend to be much more expensive than the public universities, that's without a doubt. And tuition um, dependent, often for profit. And so it's actually like, you know, lots of entrepreneurs are uh, pushing for more private universities because they can actually make money off of them and that they've thrived in countries where um, the different groups are not well served. So in Jordan has many and growing private universities that are serving sort of the Palestinians who aren't uh, don't have as equal access in the public uh, universities. And then, but in many of the sort of North African countries where ac free access to public higher education has been sort of embedded in constitutions, it's been much more controversial. Like it is growing, it does exist. But for example, when I was in like T Tunisia, is has had like has been not did not want you know sees um, private universities as sort of the second class or the um, left lower uh, universities, and so the people going to those are actually in many cases like um, sub-Saharan Africans who are coming to Tunisia to study in French. And then, so people really see them as like the uh, second class education. And so that's where they're growing versus like, and in the Gulf, there are many, many private universities that are serving the non-citizen resident populations. So I think in the big picture, that's where they're, they're really growing is in the places where there has, uh, where the um, state has a harder time sort of push, pushing back. So, but yeah, I think, it, and oh, the other point I would say is like many of them thrive by offering programs in English that or like um, having programs that are accredited that um, by international uh, associations that sort of then legitimate the legitimize the degree or offer sort of options for late, late subsequent employment elsewhere. And I know that's not so. In some ways, I think they are also growing to serve the ambitions of upper middle class families that want sort of opportunity and mobility or a degree in English. And so that's also sort of where they're thriving. And the problem, there's nothing wrong with that other than it, like with everything, I think when we, when that leads to a lack of investment in the public system, that's when it's a problem. If the, um, when, and you know, that's something the US faces as well as the private tuition is growing rapidly and states are less and less likely to sort of support their public state universities. And so this is sort of one of the things I argue is that we actually can learn, you know, we can learn a lot from each other. Um, so then, okay, yes, I definitely have talked to students. And I actually think that um, the, I mean, I, I think that I understand that universities, especially elite universities of the world, are really 
special places in many cases. You know, we really have tremendous resources on a campus like Georgetown and that they are held up as very elite and like and do promise really good quality I and mean, you get really excellent quality and many of these universities and so it's not un, it's not you know unexpected like I work in Canada now and even like the elite Canadians look to the US system even though Canada has great universities you know the most elite also look to like the Ivy League institutions as well. And so it's like not surprising that sort of elites all around the world look to these sort of particular models to, um, as, as sources of opportunity. And I um, am very uh, sympathetic to the fact that, you know, young people want opportunity. In fact, I actually, that's the way I think of internationalization generally is that it is seen as a very good thing and it is seen um, when it promises sort of opportunity when you think of it like that like a lot of internationalization efforts like scholarships abroad or um, you know a degree in English that will then open up a pathway to or, um, like the German Jordanian University you know you do two years in in um, outside of Mon and then you get a pathway to go to Germany and study and get your degree there there's like lots of these pathway programs that sort of promise future opportunity that are very desirable and that um, when they are just framed as like opportunity especially opportunity that upper middle class or middle, upper class families are really in the best position to reap the benefits of because they're already you know they've received the best sort of secondary education and they have access to that like linguistic and cultural capital to take advantage then they're really not contested in many ways like people like them and they want them and they want to take advantage of them it's the when internationalization is most contested is when it's seen as sort of in um in as sort of undermining the role the national role of the university and i do think like with everything the, when there's an under investment in the national institutions and the public institutions and you can just like exit the system then we there's less um, you know there's less focus and there you an investment in improving the system and so I um, yeah I definitely that's how I would say I mean I also, yeah, I've definitely talked to lots of students who, I mean, the, the whole book and, yeah, this book, I think a lot about the students as well, but, um, so yeah, I'm very, I understand that perspective, definitely, but I also think that not everyone has those opportunities, you know, and so what about the students who, who, you know, just going through the system where they're stuck studying in the public university in a degree that they didn't want to study, and because that's what they've been sort of slotted into and they couldn't do any better, what then are, you know, their prospects? And that's actually, um, and how do they then navigate that system too? So then, oh, the pedagogy question, that's actually really interesting. So in the, what's interesting in the UAE and the, uh, and in Qatar too is that most, I mean, very, very, very few of the professors in the universities are actually citizens. That's one of the, I mean, like, <laughs> when I was in the UAE, like, the, a survey came out of high schoolers in Dubai where they were all, like, literally the worst professor, I mean, being a university professor was literally ranked as the worst profession <laughs> among them. So funny as a professor, I think it's not that bad. <laughs> so, um, but you know, they have so, in fact, most of the professors, even in the public universities, are, are like other Arabs, often from other countries, but not um, national citizens. They have a hard time. I mean, that is growing, I know, in some places, but um, the so on one hand, it's just like who are the professors, even that, and where, what are their backgrounds, and um. Where are they coming from? But um, and then I would say, well, and that it's particularly severe. We know for males, like we, especially in the I study a lot of like the teacher labor market in the pedagogy and in secondary schools, in primary and secondary schools, even more so. That um, 
in, there are a lot of females who will go into teaching, but it's just very few males who will. And so then you end up, in, you know, the, it, it creates a lot of educational implications that you don't always think about when, like, the girls are being educated by s their the citizens and the boys are all being taught by non citizens. And so there's actually um, a lot of people who are looking at sort of why. You know, women in general in the Gulf are going to succeeding in education, graduating from, going to university, and much higher rates than the men. And there's, it's actually very complicated why that is. But um, I, I think, from my understanding, like most of the professors are still sort of trained abroad. I mean, it, you know, offering PhDs is actually pretty new to some of the universities, and some still don't. So. Um, but yeah, one of the things when I was in Qatar, the my interviews highlighted was that Qatar has invested a lot of money in trying to educate homegrown researchers, as they call them, sort of, and that they, I yeah, I did an interview with someone. He was like, you know, and they they spent so much money, and they they've he was like they've succeeded. It's like okay, it's not hundreds, it's not even. You know, it's it's. He's like, it's not thousands, it's not even hundreds, but we have like a dozen now, <laughs> like a, a dozen scholars who are doing educational research in Qatar, who are Qatari, for example, and that that is a big. I mean, if you think of it as on a system level, it takes a really long time to educate uh, and to even do a PhD and then come back and be trained as a researcher. So they were proud of that. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about the private and uh, public divide in Jordanian universities. Yeah. Just because um, I know in public universities there are also like internal systems for the like the private system mm -hmm. and the international system, which um, regardless of kind of your exit exam result, you have another opportunity to mm -hmm. enroll in a public university if you pay more money. Um, so I was wondering mm -hmm. what. Um, like, has there been kind of like what's the conversation around that? Like, is that a coping mechanism for like demand of access? But then, like, if we're thinking of access, who can actually access this and who can afford it? Or is it kind of a manifestation of privatization in public universities as well? Yeah, that um, thanks. That's a great question. So, that exists, um, the parallel tracks. I would say, so in higher education, a lot of people call that the privatization of the public system, or, and, and if that's what, you know, if you're more critical of it, that's what they call it. If you're a, sort of an economist, they call it cost sharing, <laughs> so that, um, you know, you're just increasing the um, individual con the private financing contributions to the public system. Um, and that is a model, yes, that it's not only in Jordan, it's in, e I mean, Egypt has had a parallel system, and Syria instituted one. Um, that is in, that was seen as like uh, you know in many cases like a, a good model because it was bringing in more revenue and it was a, you know getting them. Um, when I was there, I I'm trying to remember where I think it was in Jordan where I was doing some of this research where people were very uh, students in some cases like thought it was terrible. I mean like you know just wrong that you and I would be in the same classroom but paying different amounts for the same like opportunity to learn literally in the same space in the same degree like um, but whereas like if you're American and you're used to the financial aid system here students are always paying different amounts based on like sort of their family need and so for me I, the it was quite a different uh, interpretation of what it means but that they actually saw it as like we're, you know as sort of a wrong thing that but it is I mean I think that it makes sense when you think about sort of the interests involved like the it's still cheaper than going to some of the private universities right it's still it's like three times as much the tuition I think in a parallel in three to six times as much as going to the if you if you're in the sort of subsidized public system but at, you still get access to that uh, highly in demand program, sort of. So these are not, it's not every program that would have a parallel you know, track. It's the more elite ones that, um, in some cases, like medicine or, you know, and so the ones that are prestigious that there's high demand for. And so 
um, students and families are like happy to do that. And in many cases, this when I was in Jordan, the students emphasized that this um, that they actually their scores were not that much lower. You know, in many cases, they were just like marginally lower, and they would point to like students on scholarships and other programs that had much low, you know, students from rural areas getting preferential treatment at lower scores, et cetera. There's like, the, it's really contentious there, where like who gets access to, who gets to sit in for this program based on their background. And so I do think it is, um, yeah, I think these programs have emerged and are sort of thriving in these particular places because they are serving um, so many different demands, like demand for this prestigious program from the families, to a little bit more money for the public universities, um, and they're still cheaper than sort of you know a, a, a purely private institution in many cases, and yet those are not taking off in North Africa because it's harder to even like. It, it, there are protests even at the thought of charging tuition in some cases, you know, although it's not in, um, you could see them taking off in like the pharmacy or the medicine programs there as well, but there, I think it was sort of, in all of the countries where there, uh, there was sort of, I don't know, well I guess if they're taking off in Egypt too, but in Egypt they, they were very contested. They went to like the Supreme Court had to like rule on them, and they actually like struck them down at one point because they were, um, you know, the, because tuition they were seen as tuition, and tuition is in the, in the Constitution they have to have free public higher ed. So like I do think it makes sense that they're less contested in Jordan, where there's sort of the implicit we're already in the public system, people are paying some tuition and whatnot than in the, in North Africa. Time for one last okay. question. Well, first of all, thank you so much for uh, sharing all this information. Um, like when we talk about equality education or education for employability, we always focus exclusively focus on what the institution is doing to help uh, the students. But isn't this actually not the reality in the sense that students, particularly in context of economic despair, do exhibit agency, creativity, and initiative? in improving their overall learning experience and employability. I'm just, um, I came across two studies of Jordanian students, and you know, they showed that you know, these students and learners do exhibit these levels of um, agency and effort, and individual and independent effort in improving their learning and employability. So I'm wondering whether it is time to include in scholarly discourse and activity in both areas of quality education and um, education for employability, the role of learners. Yeah, I think that's a great point. De I definitely agree. Like students and are, you know, inc they do exhibit a ton of agency and independence and creativity there. You know, it's like hustling is the word we sometimes use um, here to describe like how um, people are pursuing, you know, internships or like any number of things or training courses, but also, um, and yeah, so I definitely agree with you. It's not, I, just, I focus on what the institutions are doing in many cases because they are sort of, the institutions are the ones being criticized so much. It's like the, the discourse doesn't, I mean, doesn't, Often focus on it, like doesn't often portray students as like lazy and not and just. But I, I mean, sometimes it's like maybe portraying them as like passive, yeah, in in the wake of and just taking in their pedagogy. But I would also say that yes, the students are independent and agent, and also that's where I see like faculty in many cases are too. They are trying really hard. They're like in some ways, um, you know, creating new. You know they're like evading these systems too in different ways and trying to educate their students as well. And so I, yeah, I agree with you completely. Like we we would be better served overall if like we focus more on these um, the the ways that that individuals are really trying to navigate these structural constraints and then and in ways that are really productive in many cases. Thank you so much. Thanks. We'll be yeah. very much looking forward to the book. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, Dr.